Okay. Hi. We are Fantasy Camps. Oh, the Fantasy Camps. Did the Fantasy Camps <coughs> start before Club Fred? Yes. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah, they did. Um, as a matter of fact, Mark Farner yes. uh, suggested that I go to the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Okay. And I said, it sounds like a fabulous idea. And I kept on going to the web, and I could never find it. And okay. I must have looked eight or ten different times. And I figured, okay. Mark must have made a mistake or something. Yeah, there must have been something. So I had one more call to Mark one day, and he says, you really need to try it one more time. I said, okay, I'll try it one more time. I tried it one more time, pow, there I found it, it. There it was. Okay. Yeah. And my first rock and roll fantasy camp in L.A., I got to play with Spencer Davis, Give Me Some Lovin'. Get out. Get out with Spencer Davis, okay? And, and... Once upon a time it was the Spencer Davis trio, but I don't think could it was Could have been, it, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And, and, uh... God, all these people showed up. Spencer Davis, uh... Who's the lead singer for the, for the animals? Eric Burden. Eric Burden. And more. Eric Burden shows up. He wasn't performing, he wasn't part of the, the, the camp per se, but he was just hanging out. And uh, it was interesting because in the conversation with him, he, he, he said that uh, John Lennon's reference to the walrus yes. was him. I'll be darned. He was nicknamed the walrus. Okay, I and he explained why? He might have, but I forgot. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's well, interesting how these stories evolve and, you know, yes. everything we know is a lyric. <laughs> everything that's, we speak about is a lyric, line. you know? Everything we everything know, is, we a know is a lyric. So, so that, that was Spencer Davis, Sam, as Sam and Dave was there. Uh, uh, and and the, the camper, the, the, the rock and roll fans camp, which is running today, by the way. You can actually go to them today, by the way. Um, 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 and they don't, they don't care if you play an instrument, an instrument or not. It's not a requirement. All you have to be able to do is fog a mirror and write a check. Oh, okay. And they'll hand you a tambourine or you just stand around. But it, it, it was, I've been to nine rock and roll fantasy camps and each one was just extraordinary. Um, um, my fifth rock and roll fantasy camp was the most incredible one because now I, now I can say and look into the camera and say that uh, I've I have recorded in Abbey Road Studios with a member of Queen, a guy by the name of Spike Edney, their yeah. keyboard player, uh, Gary Brooker from uh, Pro Call Harem walks in, sits down at the real Let It Be piano, and he starts playing, and I'm sitting at uh, a Hammond organ. So I got to play Whiter Shade of Pale with Gary Brooker with a member of Queen in Abbey Road Studios on the same damn Hammond organ that the Beatles used. Oh man, Fred. With each story, didn't you feel like at the end of the an end of the story that you could say, okay, I can die now? I mean it just yeah. boom, 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 exponentially. It is yeah, incredible. And this this guy David Fishoff that was in that picture. Right. He's the one that came up with this idea of fantasy camps, you know. Very cool. And 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 I got to to uh, to play with um, um, geez, lead singer for the Beach Boys. Brian Wilson. Thank you, Brian Wilson. Uh, his body was there. His mind was not. Yeah. But his body was there. Yeah. Um, 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 George Thorogood showed up. Oh, wait, yeah. you hear this one. George Thorogood shows up at one of the camps, and he's got this beat up acoustic guitar that he passed around to all the campers, and it had to be. 75 to 100 people in this room. Yes. Okay. So we're all handling this guitar that everybody that he's ever performed with has autographed. All the Rolling Stones, I mean, mm -hmm. everybody has signed this autograph, and he's passing it around for us mere mortals to touch and handle, you know? So, you know, George is George, and he's in, enjoying his stardom. Yes. So finally I had to say to him, George! When are you coming back to the deer park to play? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he said, never! <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Just want to know you're always welcome to come back, you know. Right. But since then, he's played Grand Opera House a couple of times, so I guess he's he's okay with Delaware now. Because I understand he wasn't appreciated. Well, you know, no musician is appreciated 
they in their own you'll state. Have to leave home. Exactly. Yeah. Even Boots said that. You know, he said Boots would say, he could, you know, anywhere in Tennessee, Nashville, right? nobody cared about him. He'd right. have to go someplace to be somebody. You know? Yes. No, I hear uh, I hear it all the time, and it's used as an explanation of you know the lack of including enthusiasm of your home base. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, yeah, that, go, that goes on. Okay, so when did Club Fred come into being? Club Fred, who is the house band for the Delaware Rock and Roll Society, they play everything we do, they never let us down, we are, we never even never even think about because it's scary what we would have to pay for this if we were going to have it. And here's another example of how Fred gives back, gives back, gives back. Sponsoring success anywhere he can. But if you go to anything that's Delaware Rock and Roll Society, you get Club Fred. You become a ducks. But I give so much because I get so much in return. Okay. I really do. I learned that many, many years ago. Some some speaker was talking about it. if you want to get some stuff back, just give stuff away for right. no apparent reason. Just just the more you give, you more than you get. You know, yes. and 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 I've lived that. And invariably, what I get back never comes from where I sent it. It right out of left field, something kapow, right in the kisser. Yeah. You know, and the same thing with Club Fred because um, um, it, it came about because Louise and I were getting ready to build a new home. And we had modest goals for a new home. Louise wanted a dining room with a house attached. Yes. I wanted a music room and a garage with a house attached. Right. And we both got what we wanted, okay? And you've been in my music room. Yes. Booth performed no. in my music room. Oh my. He did the first ever gig in my music room. And it was hilarious because I invited, I, I sent out invitations to 50 people, got zero responses. I went, holy crap. I sent out another 50, got zero responses. I said, I can't have Boots playing to an empty house. This is not acceptable. Right. I sent out a third uh, thing of, uh, again, 50 entirely different people again, got a couple responses. And then the week of the, uh, of, of the, the gig, everybody responded they were going to be there. I had 156 people in, in my music room. Oh, man. And you've been in my music yes. room. It holds 70 comfortably at yes. tables. We had chairs. I'm so glad the fire marshal, the nice man from the fire marshal, didn't stop in and visit us. Right. Because I would have been locked up and the key would have been thrown away. You yeah. Know? But uh, where was I headed with that story? Oh, yeah. So we, we have the music room. So that uh, before I had Boots perform there, uh, Mark Sisk, was a member of my Rotary Club, and this is after we'd moved in, we had started to get settled, and, and my ultimate goal was to have a, you know, at least have a, a band that we would jam. Right. You know, so uh, I knew Mark, Mark knew Brian Daring, our bass player. Mm -hmm. Brian, I think, knew Vinny, or somebody knew Vinny, our saxophone player, and then somebody knew Kathy, our, our, our wonderful singer, uh, and uh, did I mention we've gone through eight guitar players? Uh, eight guitar players and six drummers. Um, so, uh, and what was really funny is is we had a drummer quit, uh, as some musicians do, like that, without notice. And uh, Kathy's son was taking drumming lessons from some guy. Okay. And and here we are. We're going to be doing a gig with Mark Farner within a week, and mm -hmm. our drummer quit. Mm-hmm. Makes you wonder what kind of a person would quit. Before. That kind of, before that opportunity. But you know, right. musicians are funny people, aren't they? They're just funny people. Completely entertaining. Completely funny people. So, so um, um, I called uh, this guy who was a, the drum teacher and I said, would you like to, to play with us? And because and we're, we're playing with, with Mark Farney. He says, I know every one of his songs. I said, come on down tonight. And, and so, uh, we we are uh, uh, rehearsing with, with with AJ was was his name, and he, he, he really good. He's really tight. Had all the songs down just like he said, and then that that weekend, you know, Farner shows up. So we did the rehearsal in in, right. in, in the music room first, 
and I look over at AJ, and there's tears coming down his face. Uh, he can't believe he's playing with Mark Farn in these songs. Right. How cool is that? That is so amazingly cool. Yeah. You know, to walk away with with that sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. Exactly. Yeah. And he did a great job. And Mark even commented how, how pleased he was with AJ. And he knew he would. Wow. AJ's heart was in it. I mean, you could just tell he was excited. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't be excited playing with Mark Farner? Who wouldn't be excited? Who wouldn't be? Because he's a great guy. Yes. He really is. Yes. And he's coming here September 24th mm -hmm. to VetFest. Doing a fundraiser. A fundraiser for mm -hmm. Stop Soldier Suicide. Yeah, so, good stuff. Good stuff. So look on the web and buy tickets and come down to Middletown. Yeah, it's that. local. Yes. It's local, yes. The Fabulous Pharaohs played on his show. Some would call it that. Other, yes. Others would give it another name. And I'm sure he's already given it another name. Because we tried out for the show. Uh, and uh, we, we played normal like everybody else does. And then we decided that once, if we got accepted, we would do something entirely different. Was it the Discophonic scene then or the Jerry Blavitt show? It, I think Jerry Blavitt show. It was, was definitely first. Jerry Blavitt show. Yeah. Definitely. It, it was the day, well, we actually appeared there the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Right. Okay. And uh, on the way to the show, uh, this was before I-95 was built, so we had to go the back way through Marcus Hook pulling a trailer on my mother's station wagon. We didn't have a hearse at the time. Didn't have a hearse. <coughs> didn't yeah. have a hearse at the time. So, so the car died on the way. Mm -hmm. Went into a bar, got a guy who let us put a trailer on the back of his car with no brakes. Yeah. So I was driving that car, dragging my feet. We finally made it to the TV show about an dragging hour. your feet. For dragging my feet. Yes. Like, yes. We were an hour and a half late by the time we got there, and 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 we're we're rushing all the equipment into into the show. And uh, I was literally on the stage, pulling my pants up on the stage, oh, man. in front of the audience, as they started the cameras. Okay. The good news was I was standing behind this massive Baldwin organ that I had right. at the time, so I was covered. So yes. Right? So we we, we uh, Jerry announced us uh, as his favorite band was on the show that day. Mm -hmm. Two minutes before, he never heard of us. But when he introduced us, we were his favorite. Yes. Boy, was he going to eat those words. Yeah. So we Not start... Not because you didn't like him, but because you were making a, a we, statement. Boy, were we ever. Yes. So we decided <coughs> that, that since, you know, hardly anybody sounded that good live on Jerry Blavitt's show. We didn't sound that good to begin with, but <laughs> right on the show, I was really concerned about how we would come across. So... We all decided we'd get into theatrics. So for the two minutes and 30 seconds that we were allotted after he introduced us and we started, uh, to make a very long story short, two minutes and 30 seconds, we destroyed all our equipment. We set it on fire. Smoke was everywhere. Come everywhere. The, our, our roadie, who was, who, who, was, who was spot on in the camera, put a smoke bomb in his, in his mouth. Which is okay, but sometimes he would get ash cans confused with smoke bombs, and we were just wondering if it was, he was really going to make that statement that day. But anyway, he picked the right one. He had a smoke bomb in his mouth, and it looked like he was spewing smoke. And uh, Eddie the drummer, you know, cymbals have felt washers on the top. He had doused them in lighter fluid. He had drum, drum beaters that he also doused in lighter fluid. So he was twirling these things while they were in flames. And he'd smack a cymbal and he'd go, shh, you know, it was very effective, etc. ad nauseum. Yes. Of course, the drummer smashed, or the guitar player smashed his guitar. And unplanned, uh, we had an amplifier company called Tenike out of New Jersey that, that outfitted us with all Tenike amplifiers. And the, the not to be outdone, uh, on cue, without formal rehearsal, the amplifier burst into flames. That was not planned. Oh man. That kind of caught us all by surprise. You just know? jumped in. Yeah, so right about that time I look over and Eddie's leaving his drums. He's got his 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 uh, uh, cymbal stand in his hand and, and he's walking menacingly, menacingly over to me where my, my I'm standing behind my Baldwin organ. 
and he brings it down on top of my organ, mm -hmm. and it sticks in the top of my organ, Oh wow! breaks in half, right about the time I ducked, and it went right over my head and sliced the curtain behind me. It would have been another statement we would have made had I just been standing there. So when we got done, this debauchery, that's all you could call it, this right. noise, I looked over at Blavitt, his mouth was wide open and he'd gone pale. Mm -hmm. He spent the next minute and a half ripping us to shreds yes. on TV. Just brutal. We deserved it because we didn't tell him what we were going to do. Right. Okay. However, the reason we did it because we knew we wouldn't sound good. We had to make a statement. We needed to be different. We didn't want to be like anybody else. So You were disgusted with what had happened the day before. Exactly. Yes. So then the next three or four weeks, we got phone. Oh, he also said, I'll make sure this band never plays in Philadelphia again. Mm -hmm. For the next four weeks, the phone wouldn't stop ringing yeah. to get gigs in Philadelphia, Electric Factory, the, the flea market, and all these other kinds of places that were wow. the hot spots. So, so it accomplished what we wanted to accomplish, you know. <laughs> but Blavitt was less than thrilled. Absolutely. And then I learned he had all his old TV shows for sale. He had them all taped. So I called him, and I was surprised that he didn't remember that particular TV show. I would have thought he would have remembered that mm -hmm. one, you know. Mm -hmm. But he didn't recall it, and he said he didn't have the tape for it. So it stopped. But I would love to have him inducted into the, okay. the society. That would be a hoot. Because uh, he did contribute enough. The lot. tapes, because... I was on a couple shows. I wanted tapes too, and we haven't been able to find them anywhere. Mm. A lot of them were taped over. You know, it was that era. Yeah. So yeah, if you ever hear of any, I'm interested in, in some too. See what I can do. Okay. All right. What do you do for hobbies that's not music? Oh. I enjoy antique automobiles. Oh yes. I have I have a, I currently own a 1962 Cadillac. Can you say Fins? A 1962 Cadillac that was yeah. that was in the movie Invincible with Vince Papali. Um, um, it was filmed in, uh, in in some high schools in South Philly for about three or four weeks, and so they used my car. It was not featured in the movie. It was you know if you ever watch the movie, don't blink. Yeah. Because it, it goes by in scenes, you know, in the traffic or parked at the curb or whatever. Right. And uh, something that I always, always wanted was a Rolls Royce. And I could never find one that I really liked until one day, I swear to God, I went on eBay. I, I can't make this stuff up. eBay <laughs> has auctions, automobile auctions, right. and, and there was a bunch of Rolls Royces. So I started watching, you know, and I, I found one I really liked an awful lot. And this, this guy who had it, uh, it's a 1985 uh, Silver Spur mm -hmm. that when I got it almost 20 years ago had 19,000 miles on it. It now has slightly less than 49,000 miles on it, I think. So I didn't buy it to just look at it. I bought it to have fun with it. Right. And I, I use it, uh, you know, whenever I want to giggle to either make an impression or... You know, the, the funniest thing, I took one of my clients out in it a couple of years ago. We went to the uh, uh, Hotel DuPont for, for our show. And uh, so I, I, I dropped them all off at the curb. Right. Parked the car. I came back. And then obviously when we... Show for duty. So when we came back, uh, uh, and when the show was over, I went to get the car. And, and, and uh, my wife Louise and, and, and my client Sally were at the curb waiting and, and as I pull up in this white Rolls Royce in front of about two or three hundred people all waiting for their cars to come in. Yes. One of Sally's friends was there and says, Sally, your car is here. Yes. <laughs> so I got out of the car, opened the door, and Sally got in the car and this, the look on this woman's face was precious, absolutely precious. And Sally loved every cut oh and pick and minute goodness. of it. And she says, could we drive her in the block one more time? Because I want to rub it in her nose. I love <laughs> it. I love it. So we have, it's got a high fun factor to it. It's a lot of fun. Yes. But 
both of them get eight miles per gallon of gas. Mm -hmm. High test. Yes. So the good news is, is when I fill up the tank, I appreciate the value of them by 25%. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do.